All right. Anything you say can and will be held against you in a court of law. So just be careful. Okay. Um, is that is that Jewish court of law or or American court of law, Rabbi? You know what? I would say Jewish court of law. And so you know, it might hurt. It might not. Don't worry. <laughs> um, just be just be honest and sincere. Is there such a thing as a reform Beth Din? There is. There. You know what? A reform Beth Din is not an oxymoron. I will not answer the question fully now, but I would say yes, but not in order to make a judgment, but to give a framework for the person helping to understand who they are. So there is a reform baking. Yes. Um, I sat on it. So we're, we're at 20. We are uh, at 9.05. And uh, we should start Hebra. Uh, we have great stuff to study. And because Raj is such a great teacher, he already has the blessing here for us to share. So join me in the blessing. <coughs> Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Kishanu Mishpatah Amen. Amen. So um, this is uh, a great Torah portion. It's a classic, as they say. Nothing new there. Um, it is Kedoshim. Uh, and uh, we're studying something we've studied so many times before, um, a little bit differently, and certainly with a different draft So, so um, this is the Holiness Code. <clears throat> it is, uh, uh, it actually runs, uh, starts before this in Parsha uh, Um And <clears throat> Uh, continues in Emor. Rabbi Polar's, uh, I don't know where he got this, but he probably got it from some traditional source. Um, uh, in the same rabbi, way Rabbi Polar, Allah Shalom, had idioms that I didn't quite understand. I didn't understand this because he never explained it. But whenever I would say any of these portions, he would say, ah, Akare Mod Kedoshi Emor. And I didn't know what he meant, which means after the death of the holy ones or righteous, you must speak. He eventually explained it to me, and I understood, meaning um, that uh, memory is sacred and that you have to speak about those who have gone from this life um, uh, in a righteous way, and you have to remember their holiness as a model for you. And so in a way, we do that today. Um, uh, and we remember those still with us, which is crucial, uh, who are righteous role models. Um, the text we know, um, it's all about loving your neighbor, understanding who our neighbor is, understanding how far that responsibility goes, and how that can make uh, help us make life holy. And it will very much relate to the world we live in today. I made sure of that. Um, in the uh, in the so and um, and also in our in our discussion, uh, we're going to read from the beginning of the portion just to frame it, and then and then give us give us the build up <clears throat> to uh, what's been called Klal uh, Gadol Batorah, the chief principle of all of Torah, which is verse eighteen. Um, I'm going to start with the people here reading because they're here. Um, Lisa, give us this text. The Hebrew is much better, but I'm going to make a read in English. The Eternal One spoke to Moses saying, speak to the whole Israelite community and say to them, you shall be holy for I, the Eternal, your God, am holy. You shall each revere your mother and your father and keep my Sabbaths. I, the Eternal, am your God. Do not turn to idols or make molten gods for yourselves. I, the eternal, am your God. You shall not steal. You shall not deal deceitfully or falsely with one another. You shall not swear falsely by my name, profaning the name of your God. I am the eternal. All right. So, uh, right. So, again, we're getting the, the build up here, but we're getting the framing for what does it mean to live a holy life? Keep going, Lisa. You shall not defraud your fellow. Uh, you shall not commit robbery. The wages of a laborer shall not remain with you until morning. 
you shall not insult the deaf or place a stumbling block before the blind. You shall fear your God, I am the eternal. You shall not render an unfair decision. Do not favor the poor or show deference to the rich. Judge your team fair fairly. Do not deal basely with members of your people. Do not profit by the blood of your fellow Israelites. I am the eternal. You shall not hate your kinsfolk in your heart. Reprove your kin, but incur no guilt on their account. You shall not take vengeance or bear grudge against members of your people. Love your fellow Israelite as yourself. I am the eternal. Yeah, we're going to stop there. I don't know why we have verse 19, uh, but who knows? You know, we don't need it. We're going to stop at 18 um, uh, at, uh, at I am Yitra, or I am Adonai. So if you looked at these holy code laws and asked yourself, so what strikes you? How is the definition of being holy being put forth there? What is it telling us about what it means to live a holy life? And... Um, and, uh, and what is it saying to us as, as people in this world today? What strikes you on a shot level? Well, yeah. first of all, that we're, we are holy as God is holy, so that we have, to, we have to go within ourselves and touch that spot within ourselves and treat others from that place. Beautiful, very drashy. So on a shot level, I would say you're noting it says... Ki kadosh ani Adonai, a lot. It's a repeated phrase. And we have to understand that somehow we are supposed to be emulating a divine role model. Zev, Raj, then Jane. So Maimonides said that you cannot say anything positively about God. Yeah. No, nothing about God. Yeah. In Kabbalah, they try to find out God attributes. Yeah. I think that in verse two, yeah. You correct me, Jeffrey. It's the uh -huh. only place in the Torah where God says, I am something. There's a self-revelation here. I am holy. It doesn't say anywhere else what I am. And the other thing that I think is interesting is that he equates what he is with the human being. I know B'Tselem Elohim, Asautam. Yeah. He made him in the image of God. Yeah. But here he actually, so the two things, there's a self-revelation, I am. Yeah. yeah. And then there's this, you know, comparing God to a human being and saying, in this way, we're the same. Yes, yeah, so that, so beautiful. So Zebby's building on what, what Susan said. So somehow, our holiness only happens when we know we're linked with the Holy One. <coughs> hmm. Hmm. All right. And I would say, just note, there is another self-revelation, depending on how you understand it, which is uh, Exodus 34, Judge chapter five. I mean, verse five. What is that sound? Do you hear that sound? What is that? Oh, wait. That sounds awful. Is everybody hearing an awful sound there? Oh no. No. It's echo. Oh my god. All right. All right. How's this? Okay. Okay. It's still not as bad. Do you guys have an echo on your computer, Elaine? Do you hear an echo on your computer? A little bit, a little bit. A little echo, yeah. It's weird that it should not be. All right, somebody do me a favor. Just go get Carlos and see if he can uh, do this. This is where does he sit? I've always wanted to be like the Wizard of Oz figure. Where does he sit? You know what? It, it, if you go upstairs, you'll see him. But in the social oh, wait, far, wait. the far door on the far left is his office. Dave, don't go. Wait, wait, wait. I think I may have found the phone. I think it's Tom. All right. How's this sound? Better. It's Better. just Tom. Tom wanted That's to good. be on both. And uh, because he wanted to have his cake and eat it too. This is excellent. All right. Okay. So we've just fixed the problem. Wait, Jeffy, so what does it say in Exodus? You yeah, well, say. remember what it says. It says, right? God comes down. Moses, Moses and God are meeting. It's the second giving of the commandments. And God says, Adonai, Adonai, El Rahum Vachanun, So those are the 13 attributes of God. The problem yeah. is, unlike here, Zebi, right. we don't know who's saying that. Right. So here, God says, Ani, 
Adonai, and God is saying, Ki kadosh ani Adonai, you've got to be like me, because I am holy. The big question, of course, is, what, what does that mean? Is holy. Yeah. Right, right. So I got Raj and Jane and Lisa. So Rabbi, um, uh, uh, this, at the Peshat level, this uh, comes to me as very earthly. Uh, and I think if we are looking at uh, how do we become holy, which I've always kind of wondered, like, you know, what does it mean to be Kiddoshim? What does it mean to be, uh, like, you know, to be holy? Yeah. I think here, here's a practical uh, answer for us right here in these verses. Uh, and those are very earthly verses. Uh, in order for you to be holy, uh, you should be kind to people. You should love your, like, you know, Lareya Hakamoka. Yeah. Um, and like, don't, I mean, literally like practical things. Um, mm -hmm. And I think so in order to be uh, holy, uh, I mean, there is no, uh, that you uh, like, you know, pray five times a day, like in Islam or, or like, you know, uh, constantly praying, praying, praying. Yes. I, I, yes. I, I, yeah. yeah. So, so Raja, Raja is noting that this is a working definition of holiness. It's not unlike, and I, how many times have I introduced this core portion and said, you know, what's holy? If you were going to say holy, you'd say, oh, what's a holy? The Pope is holy, right? Mother Teresa is holy. In Judaism, what's holy? You know, the guy who's nice to people. The woman who uh, feeds the birds. The, so holiness has a whole different, it's very earthly, Raj, and I appreciate that note. And we're going to come back to that, right? I have, right, we, we solved the problem. We solved the problem. And I'd like you to arrest Tom Lando. Uh, no, no, it's all good. It's all good. We got it. We got it. We got it. We got it. It's all good. It's all good. So, um, so thank you. We got it. We got it. Uh, uh, so, uh, so I have a Jane, then John, then Andy. And uh, then Lisa, then Andy. This is um, strikes me as being a blueprint, a blueprint for a society, for a community. Um, okay. And because, and the reason I say that is because, um, you know, we, we were created in God's image, and so we should, we should, uh, we should uh, act appropriately. Um, we're talking about holiness, but I think the love your neighbor as yourself. Um, that everything in here is inclusive in that. It's included in all of that. So if you love your neighbor as yourself and do all these things, then you are then you are being holy because this is the way you should act. And okay, so I, I don't necessarily disagree with you, but I think the, the crux of the matter will come to how do we understand that verse? And, and we're going to get there in a moment, right? Uh, I have John, Lisa, Andy, Elaine, then Arnie, and then I'm probably going to be I have to say Shabbat Shalom. Go ahead. Okay. Um, <clears throat> A comment and a question. Um, verse three is intriguing to me. You shall each revere your parents. The other, the other um, um, commandments are seemingly aimed at the community. The, it, it's this is I don't know what the Hebrew is, but you shall each seems to be the one that is individual. Um, and yeah, then I also thought yeah. it was interesting yeah. to link that with keeping the Sabbath. So. Uh, revering your parents, whatever revere might translate how what the real word is, and the Sabbath are linked in this in a in a in a way that um, I guess I didn't seem thought of before. Yes, and what what your what your comment points out, John, as well is that somehow though we start in the plural, plural we shift to the individual, so we shift to the singular and then back to the plural. So that right. is a core question as well. Right, I got Lisa, then I got Andy, then I got away. Um, it's just interesting that there are all these laws and rules for the people to follow, but God just being is there. Uh, that he, he's, all he has to be is there. Yeah, like when it keeps saying, I am God, there's only, you know. Yeah, yeah. so Lisa, Lisa points out that uh, like God doesn't have, uh, you know, a how-to guy. Right, we have a how-to guide. God doesn't. In fact, I would just shift your words around because you said all we have to do is be there, right? So because God is, yeah, just being, just being. I don't know, being, right? I got Andy, Elaine, and Arnie. So I'm noticing, and, and this might be just really Peshat, 
um, the balance of positive versus negative. Yeah. Uh, the you shall nots versus the you shalls. Yeah. So when we talk about love and reverence and keeping the Sabbath and having fear or awe of God, it's just those those four are are the positive what you shall do versus what you shall not do, which are all don't steal, don't swear falsely, don't defraud. Yes. Yes. I, I just find this fascinating. Yeah, it's human nature. And, and in fact, it's a, I have counted before. It's a three to one balance, positive versus negative. And the reason is, the, 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 uh, the truth is, it's the same ratio in Parshat Bahukotai when we have all the blessings and the curses. I think it's a commentary on human nature, uh, to be honest with you. Um, but clearly, what you're pointing out on a shot level is being holy is not about only what you do, but what you refrain from doing. Crucial, right? I got Elaine and Arnie. Oh, hold on, whoops, wait a minute. Uh, Elaine, you're good, I hear you. Oh, okay. Um, they, uh, to uh, follow up on what Raj said, it's, uh, it's interesting that there's a, an old saying that in Judaism, it's the deed, not the creed. It's what right. you do and not what you believe. And clearly it's all about creating a, a healthy society that if you don't do all those things, you have a society that doesn't have anarchy, that, that everyone can live in security and peace. And that mutuality of relationship with God, you can't have that relationship with God unless you live in a healthy society and have that society to relate to and, and create the congregation from. Yes, yes. So it's about creating the community by individual through individual responsibility and buy-in to this code of living, right? We can come back to that in a second. All right. You know, I mean, all this is very nice, but the 800 pound elephant in the room that's not being addressed is, what about evil? Do you have an obligation? Is it holy to stand up against evil, to fight it, to kill it, to destroy it? <coughs> I don't hear anything like that in here. Well, you have, to, you have to look closely, but it's here. Yeah, right. My favorite verse here, which we're not going to study today is, al tamod al damreyecha. Do not stand idle while your neighbor bleeds, right? Okay. Because I am I don't not, which means if somebody's in danger, if somebody is, you know, uh, you know, a victim, or if somebody might be hurt, stand up, exactly. shout out, exactly. do something, right? So it's very much here. I would just, so the, um, you know, and, and I would just, uh, again, one notation on Elaine's, I think really important point, um, is this really about a society for Jews? Is this, is this about creating a world where, uh, you know, where, um, boy, we treat the Jews well, yeah, but if you're not Jewish, maybe, all depends. You know, I don't think so, though some translations would like to think so. Um, I would vehemently disagree uh, based on many things and lots of years of study. Uh, and that's going to take us to our key verse. Look at the key verse. Here's the key verse, and they're always couplets, as um, you know, as Andrea Weiss, great Bible teacher and current, um, uh, what is she? The, uh, she's the president of it? No, uh, no, she's not the president. She's the uh, the something of HUC, the head of HUC. I don't remember what it's called. Um, so verse eighteen, lo tikon velo titor et bene amecha. Don't take vengeance or bear a grudge against the children of your people that, or against your fellow. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Adonai. Notice what the translation is, because Cynthia took it from the new JPS. She typed it in. Love your fellow Israelite as yourself. I don't think so. I really don't. Um, based upon the context and what's going on here, it may be intended speaking to the people of Israel, but I don't think this is meant alone for us, nor for us to only treat those who have carrying cards that say people of Israel. I'm going to quickly uh, go to, I see, I see Gail's hand up, and then we're going to go to the rest. One question. Yeah. Love your neighbor as yourself. What happens to people with self-hate? Excellent question. Really good shot, Reed. And we actually, 
We'll address that in the commentary, which is great. Everybody go to the remnants, which Raj has already done for us. You guys got to turn the page if you're here. <coughs> uh, Raj cannot turn your pages for you. Um, so what are the rabbis making of this? Uh, I see Steve's hand up on Mars. I think it's Steve's, but uh, before we go, I want to take Steve's comment. Hi, um, it's Steve. So um, this is, uh, I'm having a hard time with this because- Good. Good. Uh, I'm, I'm in New York real estate. I deal with this every day of my life. And one of the worst offenders of this is the Orthodox crowd. When you do business with them, you, you, I mean, I have a situation right now where, and it's just, there's, there's nothing that stops them from lying and cheating. And you have to count your fingers after you're done walking out of a meeting with them. So, I mean, this is all fine and good, but uh, it's hard for me to buy into this. That's yeah, all. I well, mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's, 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 yeah, I, I want to say this. Uh, I want to say, Steve, first of all, I appreciate that candor. <laughs> I, want, and I know that you deal with these folks. Uh, and But let's just say this. I would bet, in fact, I know, uh, and you're dealing a lot of times with really the ultra-Orthodox crowd, right? Yeah, pretty um, much so. Right. Yeah. There, are, there, you know, there, are some, there are some folks in that crowd who are really... Uh, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. But I'm saying that this is, a, to me, this is a, a, a make you feel good kind of approach to life. It's, it makes you feel good and you want to live to those expectations. But when you go to work every day and, and this is what goes on, it makes you think twice, especially yeah, so, when it's- So Steve is saying, this ain't easy, right? It's an ideal that is hard to implement in reality. Real last comment is going to be Ellis. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, a lot of these things can be turn, can take what I call a sectarian turn. And inside of a sectarian turn, all of the energy goes inside. And those people on the outside have no, they, they don't, almost, they almost don't matter. They don't count. Yeah. Okay. This is not talking about them, it's talking about us. Right. In which case, what you might consider to be criminal, they don't consider criminal at all because yes. it's about us and not them. Right. 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 Which is, which is the danger of translating we're aha. So what is Rhea? Rhea is your fellow, right? Zedo di Bezerei. It can be somebody you love. It doesn't, right? Shachain is the word for neighbor, right? And fellow Israelite, by juxtaposition, you could define it like that, but there's no reason to. There's no reason to limit it. So Ellis underscores the danger of thinking insular, insularly, right? Um, I'm going to move on only because it's 9.30 almost. Right, Jeff, did you have a quick comment? About yeah, where, just where very quickly, very quickly. Yeah, yeah. So what strikes me is, is the difference or non-difference between verse 17, yeah. which says you shall not hate your kinfolk in your heart, then you skip a verse, and then he says, love your fellow Israel as yourself. Why does, you know what I'm saying, Jeffrey, there's one, it's about the same thing. But yeah. he uses kin folk in one and he uses Recha in the other. One is about hate, one is about love. Why twice? Why the difference? Yeah, I have no answer. So let's just answer that question. It's a very good question. Because verse 17 is again a couplet that says, Lo tisna et meaning, do not hate your brother in your heart. Who's your brother? Well, I call my brother Wayne my brother. He's not Jewish necessarily, though I think he's a member of the tribe of Israel. So what does that mean? And then they give you the answer in the second part of the couplet. That is, you shall surely reprove your people so as not to carry sin around with you. That is, how do you get rid of the hate in your heart? Be honest with other people. Tell them what you think. Don't carry around grudges. Don't carry. That's why the next verse is, and by the way, do not take vengeance or bear a grudge because it's a natural extension of carrying around hate. If Arnie harbors hate inside and never shares it with the person, that's a problem. Jeffrey, I have to respectfully disagree. Good. And the reason I see it, when I see what's going on in the world, how can you not be hateful towards people 
who are trying to kill you and devalue everything that you hold dear to your heart. How yeah, you do yeah. by the way, by the way, I didn't say that. So you're misunderstanding what I just said. I said, right, if, first of all, it, it says, don't carry hate in your heart. It says, share, share what you feel. That's what it says. What about acting on it? It's there too. It's all of this is acting on it. Okay. Right? All of this is acting on it. But the key is, right? Uh, whoever said it was right, Elaine, Lisa, everybody, verse 18. We're going to jump to the remez. We're going to see what the commentators teach us. And then we're going to read some a great drash and a wonderful stuff. Um, so take a look. Um, verse two is just setting the tone. You've already said it before. We don't even need it. Kedoshim to you, why is this written in the plural? For only as we consider our connection to others do we have any hopes of attaining holiness. That's the gear around it, right? We're not going to be holy by sitting on a mountaintop. Hermits and, mo hermits and monasteries are noticeably absent from Judaism. We are a hopelessly communal people. I am quoting our teacher, Rabbi Larry Kushner. So how do we understand verse 18, which is the key? The first part of the couplet, we're going to spend just a little time. On. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against your people. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. John Borden, give us, uh, give us the, the beginning here. The Rashbam starts, interestingly. Okay, on this account, Torah condemns... No, no, no. Oh, yeah, no, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, on this account. It's the Rambam, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Right. On this account, Torah condemns bearing a grudge. For so long as a person harbors the feelings in his heart, he is in danger of taking vengeance. But if people can remove evil from their hearts, life can bring peace. Again, this is all aspirational, but it's saying, and, 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 and again, it's not, you know, it, it says many times in the Torah, you shall wipe evil off the face of the earth. You shall rise against hate. You shall not follow a mob to do um, to do evil. Again and again in Torah, in the laws of Torah. This is talking about how you get along in a society that is trying to be civil. What is it saying? It's saying, don't harbor your feelings inside because then you'll be in danger of taking vengeance. Right? Hertz underscores that. Meaning, go ahead. John. Tot forbids repaying evil with evil. The Talmud teaches, if a man finds both an enemy and a friend in distress, in order to subdue his Yetzer Hara, let him help the enemy first. Right. Why, why is church? And again, enemy here doesn't mean the person who's putting you in ghettos or gas chambers. That's, it. That's not, this is not love for those people. It's not love for evil. It is, however, saying, you know, this guy, somebody I really love, he's my friend. This guy, not so much. This guy served on the outs with me. Don't really know him, but I'm not sure, right? Hasn't done anything wrong to me, but he's clearly not my, or maybe he's my business competitor, or et cetera. Steve. Uh, uh, Jeff, just going back to verse 18. Yeah. It says, uh, you shall uh, not bear a grudge against your people, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, is your neighbor meant to be outside your people, or is it, I mean, is that everybody, or is that your neighbor within the community? Right. So. So I, I would argue, right, as Ellis, you know, sort of underscored here, that neighbor means, you know, everyone, all people. Who knows who your neighbor's going to be? Um, I'm going to read one thing that if anybody still has their hand up, Gail, Ellis, or Mar, or Steve, I'm glad to call on you, but I think you may have just had that up from before. Okay. Um, so uh, let me just read one thing. So. I went back to Hertz because I said, what else does he say? Here's what um, uh, Rabbi Joseph Hertz, uh, you know, chief rabbi of the British Commonwealth in the mid 20th century says, in the shadow of the Holocaust. Um, um, the rabbis uh, give the following explanation. Uh, if a man says, I will not lend you the tool you require because you didn't lend it to me when I asked for it, that's vengeance. If a man says, I will lend you the tool, Although he refused to lend it when I asked for it, that is bearing a grudge. And then he cites the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, which is an intertestamental book, the same time as the Maccabees, 
Thank you. Love ye one another from the heart. And if a man sin against thee, I don't know why you're doing Jacobean English, but he is, cast forth the poison of hate and speak peaceably to him. If he confesses and repents, forgive him. But if he be shameless and persists in his wrongdoing, even so, try to forgive him in your heart and leave to God the avenging. Beware of hatred. It works lawlessness even against the Lord himself. What is, what is Hertz trying to do here? Hertz and his generation suffered the greatest human hatred we know, which was the Nazi regime. Hertz is saying, I'm not going to carry that around with me. Arthur Wolf escaped the Gestapo in 1938 by forging papers, got his, his family. He was out maybe 20. He got here with his family and his, and his uh, siblings. Arthur Wolf would stand up at Brother Rebecca's as he did once and say, I don't hate all Germans. The Nazis, they should rot in hell. So you're not gonna, you're, you're not gonna hate, condemn an entire peoplehood. However, if a group tries to destroy you, okay, hatred is, is valid. So Hertz is trying to help us understand when it comes to the majority of folks who are not your avowed enemies, we have to aspire to love your neighbor. Lisa. A couple of questions. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I mean, here it's different from an eye for an eye and also it's different. God has vengeance, but it's okay because God is being himself but it, he doesn't follow the same rules. I mean, he takes vengeance on- Yeah, until the third and fourth generation, right? Yeah. That's what we tell him, right? Yeah, yeah. and cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so it, it's tough to be a human judge and try to stand in God's shoes. Um, certainly we rise up against evil. Yes, agree, 100%. But when somebody else does something that we consider questionable, we don't always know how and why. So if we're going to judge them and basically, it's tough. It's very hard. It's tough. This is this is a tough line to walk. Very tough. Rabbi, I yeah. have a question. Yes, I, um, I understand what Arthur was saying about not hating all the Germans. Yeah. But there were, but there were, uh, I guess you could call accessories after the fact. People who were not Nazis but who participated. So what about them? Uh, again, I, I, I am not um, applying this historically. I would say to you, uh, again, the aspiration here is verse 18. What does that mean? I'm going to hold off my answer to you and allow the commentary to speak. And eventually, I think we'll form an opinion. There's nothing wrong and everything right, certainly from a covenantal perspective, about standing up and fighting against those who seek your destruction. That is commanded in the Talmud and in the Torah. Right? I, I have Ellis, then I have Susan, then I have Dave. Okay, I would agree that this is the, it's what I call the paradox and the paradox. <laughs> in the sense that, you know, as a, in the, over the many years, as being a member of the military and also studying the Holocaust and other sort of purgations, Oftentimes, these things are at the end of the sentence and not at the beginning, which means that we can't say, okay, what if we find ourselves in a Holocaust? What do we do then? Yeah. It's a setup. You never find yourself inside of a Holocaust until you're inside of one. Everything yeah. is the byproduct of everything that came before it. Yeah. Yeah. The Holocaust is the answer to the failure of what they're trying to get us to understand, yeah. Yeah. not the beginning of what do we do now? Yeah, yeah. It, in fact, the, the antithesis of love your neighbor as yourself is a moment like, you know, the night of terror of, of the Nazis because they didn't see it. So they were up, they saw us as not human. We were not in the 13 million who, who, were, who were murdered, right? Susan and then did. Well, what I see is as love your neighbor as yourself and, moving on from uh, 
doing any harm to a neighbor who has given you grief is an opportunity for self-reflection first, and then an opportunity for evolving into something closer to being godly as what is commanded uh, to be holy. Yes, yes, beautiful. Yeah, it's about, it's, right? Loving your neighbor is about who you are. That's about who you are as you, as you make done. And can you be godly in your interconnections? David, and I gotta go to the text. I'm gonna call on Carol Scheffler to be my reader. I, I'm having it still a hard time with her, it's, you know, with what Arnie was saying. I don't understand the enemy part. You know, the Ukrainians certainly feel that the Russians are the enemy. Right, right. Yeah. They're, all, they're also evil. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to distinguish between those two things. Yeah. I would say Hertz isn't talking about an enemy as in a moral, a mortal enemy, but maybe a moral enemy, meaning he doesn't believe exactly what I believe. He's on a different side a strange, of the political it's spectrum. A, it's a strange word to use. Yeah, well, you know what? Again, he and, and I can't say that I'm right. I'm just presuming based on, I've read a lot of hers, right? But I know he's responding to the next generation of Jews in Britain who were bombed by the Nazis. And I know Hertz visited Germany. Did he love Germans? And No. Did he, did he have friends? Yes. So I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that he's not carrying the hate full. We got to go. Carol Scheffler, can you be my reader for verse 18, the first section? We're going to start with the Rashbam. This is Rashi's grandson. Watch what he does. Love your neighbor. If he's good, but if he's wicked, the fear of God is to hate evil. Ah, so he, he's saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. Neighbor means somebody that can be your neighbor. If, 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 he's, if he's wicked, forget about it. So th this is, and he's putting it right out there. It's hard to love somebody, right? If they can't love you back or if they, if they are responsible. So this is a qualification and somehow conditional to a degree, right? Uh, now watch what other commentators will do. Just so we know that the Jews are always fighting against each other. Um, look at court, Moshe, uh, Moshe Cordovero. Love your neighbor, Lareacha. Let a person be accustomed to opening his heart, loving all fellow men, including the wicked, as if they were his brothers. Even more, think only of their good side. Do not focus on their vices. Why should I hate another if he is precious in God's eyes? So he's, so he's trying to be so magnanimous and open. Now, again, um, I think this is an impossibility, personally, right? Impossibility, right? I got to keep commentary, then I got to go on, okay? Uh, now watch, so you just see the juxtaposition here, how hard doing this is and how qualifications and conditional, conditional uh, moments or co the conditions of the moment have to enter in to what does it mean to love your neighbor as yourself. Um, the Ramban, Nachmanides, takes the key word meaning not love, but liracha. Because liracha doesn't mean love your neighbor as yourself. It means a little something different, Cat. It's written not love your neighbor, reacha, but liracha, love towards your neighbor. Sometimes a person will be interested in his neighbor's wealth, but not his attaining wisdom. His love for neighbor will be qualified, not fully towards him. He will want to be superior to his neighbor in certain respects, to be above, not on par. This Torah condemns. A person should see himself as reaching towards, never begrudging any other the maximum good he hopes for himself. All right, again, this is, this is hard to do. We see ourselves in competition. Again, I'm not talking about the evil other at this moment. I'm talking about the majority of human beings with whom we are neighbors. All right. You know, uh, on a recent trip to California, my son-in-law introduced me to very close friends of his, a woman who was German born, whose father was Stasi and her husband, Christian. And she tells me that every time she meets Jewish people, they ask her, how do you feel about what your father did? 
And she says, I can't control that. But what I can control is how I behave with people today now. So loving, warm individual. So I think discernment and dissecting the past from the present in order to be able to go forward without the hatred. I think that's a very good thing to do. But it's not easy. Not easy. Because it's in her face all the time. Not easy. Not easy for her. Sometimes not easy for us. Yeah. Right? Because we want to other. We want to make others. We want to we wanna otherize, so to speak. Othering, something like that. Um, so, so see, what are the rabbis dealing with here? They're dealing with, you know, what's the extent of Lurea Ramban says it's about wanting for your neighbor, acting toward your neighbor, right, in the same way, right, um, that you would hope for yourself, right? You want the good for him that you would want for yourself. Um, uh, Professor Malamat, uh, who I don't know where I found it. I found it a couple of years ago. I don't remember who this is. Um, he's just saying be helpful. Um, but but Shai held uh, is, uh, is, I think, underscoring our point in this first section. Carol, last one. Just read me Shai Hell. Um, can you scroll up a little bit, Raj? Thanks. Aha. Okay. Love your neighbor should be translated more accurately as be of use to your neighbor. As oh, no, 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 skip, skip that one. Go with the one beneath it, Rabbi okay. Shai Hell. Got it. Love your neighbor as yourself. I am, I am Adonai. Torah does not drive a wedge between action and emotion. On the contrary, its ideal is to integrate them, to feel passionately about God and so observe God's commandments, to care about people and to act caringly toward them. The argument that Torah obligates us to do but not feel strikes me as alien to the Torah's vision. Right, so this was the beginning of a longer Torah commentary well, what is he saying? Where does love your neighbor as yourself come from? What is the place of that? Is that following a bunch of prescribed rules? Or is it leading with your heart? Or is it both? I think it's both. I think that these rules are rules that try to guide us in living with and leading with our hearts which doesn't mean it's easy. Sometimes the hardest person to love is your neighbor. And notice what it doesn't say. As Gail brought up before, and Gail, I think I have to make you my reader here. It doesn't say like your neighbor. Because we all have those neighbors at some point in time. And I, I'm thinking physically, but I'm also thinking the person who shared the office with, the person we'd see on the train, the person who lived across the street, right? They were not likable. They, it was hard. That doesn't mean that we can't, in quotes, love them or treat them in a caring, respectful, dignified way. Um, so, Gail brought up the point, so I have to let her read this. This is Jacob Spee Mecklenburg, Hatav HaKabbalah. The word Kamocha, Gail. Just got to unmute. Okay. The word Kamocha is the operative one in this commandment. Actually, no two people can fulfill the central pr principle in just the same way. An iconoclast who expects little in the way of friendship from others has then fulfilled this primary law as soon as he relates to his fellow with the same degree of minimal devotion that he himself expects from others. But yourself, certainly not less. The meaning of kamocha is kamo ata, like you yourself. Appreciate others as you should yourself. So what is it saying? It's saying, Torah expects you to become yourself and not less, right? That means in order to love others, you have to learn to love yourself. It's implied in this. And in fact, Susan said it, or she implied it. It's not easy to love others. It certainly is not always easy to love yourself. Um, and so there's a double-edged sword being played out here. 
or, and I'm sure Ellis has some really cool word for this, right? So this, it, it's, it's almost like uh, a symbiotic uh, challenge, which is if I, can, if I can learn to love myself, I can learn to love others. If I learn to love others, maybe that will help me love myself. But if I don't love myself, how can I truly ever love others? And if I don't love others, what does that say about myself? John, Jeff, I, I'm Bishop Wayne, Bishop Wayne. You know, you gonna, first of all, are you at an airport? Are you at an airport? No, nah, this is not an airport. Okay, good, good. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. I, was just gonna, I was just gonna say that, you know, one of the distinguishing verses in the, the, the scriptures, Jesus said, that, that the, the distinguishing mark of a Christian would be how they loved one another. And yes. basically the two key uh, commandments to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind and all your strength, and then to love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, my thing is if you develop a relationship with God, then basically he's gonna help you to love yourself. Therefore you'll be able to also lo love your neighbor and develop the kind of community that you see in the book of Acts, where that community of believers in following what Jesus taught, the, the unbelieving community looked at them and said they're Christ-like. In other words, if they're following his principles. Yes, yes. So, but, you, but you, I love your core point, which is somehow it all revolves around or is grounded in God. Yeah. Meaning, this is not ethical culture, right? The end of the verse, the end of the verse says, Kedos Peret, it says, you shall be holy, for I and I have got him holy, right? Yeah. Our key verse says, um, uh, love your neighbor as yourself, ani Adonai. Why? Because I am Adonai. Which implies the degree to which you understand I am Adonai will help you love your neighbor and maybe learn to love yourself. They're all interconnected. Uh, Gail, just read me, if you would, Gail, the Kutzka Rebbe, which is the flip side of all this. Um, the Kutzka Rebbe is the great melancholy rabbi, you know, of, uh, of Kutzka, but Menachem Mendel. And he, he's the, uh, he, he, we'd expect him to say this. Love your neighbor as yourself? Is falling in love with yourself such a commendable thing? Rather, to prevent the idolatrous love of self, you must extend love in kind to your neighbor lest you lose the image of God. Right? A narcissist can't see beyond him or herself or their self. A narcissist gets caught up in self-love and thus can't love anyone else. That's what the Cusker's worried about. It's very Hasidic, right? But also a good balance. I got John, then I got Zeb. Yeah, I was, I was just reflecting on this, that first of all, it's really hard to follow a bishop. Uh, with any kind of, of useful comment. Uh, anyway, but uh, it, this is terribly hard to know yourself. To love yourself means you have to understand and know yourself a and to be honest about yourself. Yeah. It's like we're at Yom Kippur. And yeah. it's very difficult. I mean, the first task seems to me that you're being called upon to really reflect on who you are. Yeah. And and start from there. Um, it's not just about love, whatever that means to, to your neighbor or loving yourself. It's really understanding who you are and, and how, with all the flaws that that implies. Yes, yes, right. Th this, is, um, this is a very difficult um, you know, commandment to fulfill. Maybe the most difficult. I got Zebby, then I got Susan. Then we're gonna read the Ramez in reverse, the Drash in reverse order. Okay, so I'm anticipating Bedoch Etz Chaim, the next commentator that you're gonna to refer to. I'm gonna ask you to read it in a minute if you anticipate. Go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll read it if you want to I'll read it now. But I yeah, want to ask ahead. you a question. Before I do that, I want to ask you a question. The translation, because translation is important, the translation that you use on the cover sheet where you're comparing the Hebrew and the English. If the new JPS would be really, inspired. really, inspired. yeah. So, so let me ask you. So the new JPS says fellow and in parentheses Israelite. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And you know what? You know why they say it? Why? Because Rabbi Harold Kushner infers it from context because of the previous verse. 
Okay, so I looked at the at the old JPS and I looked at the stone chumash. I looked at both of them. By yeah. the way, nobody nobody says neighbor. I That's don't know where that came from. Nobody says neighbor. Yeah. Because it yeah. really doesn't mean neighbor. Echa means fellow. Yeah. Okay? Which yeah. doesn't mean it's not Jewish. All Jewish are not Jewish, but it doesn't mean neighbor. But the fact that they editorialize and they put Israelite in there, the new JPS, it's mean spirited. Well, I'll tell you where it also comes it from. It's everything from, that we just yeah. said. Well, yeah, it, it's a discussion. Yeah, it's a, it's a dialogue in the Talmud. And because Kushner knows what's going on in the Talmud, because they have a big argument in the Talmud. Who is Rehaz? Right? How much are we obligated to love? And then, so he's go, he is extrapolating the Talmud, one person's opinion, and it's time. only Israel. Right? Mm -hmm. right? Right. So I agree with you, Seth. I totally agree with you. Uh, 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 but don't, don't give up this yet because uh, you're gonna, it's got a good lead in. I'm going to let Susan, Ellen, and Philip speak, and then Debbie's going to read Derek H. Okay, there's, there's, a, there's a major point here. That okay. First, first, I want to uh, tell Wayne that I wholly agree with him that you have to find the godliness within yourself. And that, that you do, how, how you love yourself can be um, by doing good for your neighbors, you may not feel good about yourself, but if you start doing things that are admirable, you can see yourself in a different light. Yes, yes. And that, and that yeah. way, that yeah. way you grow into loving yourself in, yeah. in a very healthy yeah. manner. Again, there is no one way, but a possible path and certainly affirming. Yep, Ellen. Oh, can you hear me? So, totally. Uh, yeah, I, I have two comments. First, but just very quickly, the Kotzka Re Rebbe reminded me of Ovid's tale of Narcissus, who yes. falls into the pool because when he loves himself, he can't relate to, to anyone else. Yes. The other comment, though, I think is a more um, meaningful, perhaps. It seems to me that memory is very important here. And when you remember things that have been done, um, which are very destructive, then it's harder to, to forgive and to love. If you forget those things, then perhaps you can sort of start from scratch. But I'm not sure that it's a good idea to forget. And yeah. so how does memory, how does remembering, Judaism is so much about remembering. And if we really remember, um, I was on a call yesterday with a scholar who's, participating in a big international conference in Berlin on the question of hijacking memory. And of course it had to do with the Holocaust. Yes. Now, that, now that 50 years have passed and no, no longer people are no longer alive who do remember. So I, I think we have to factor in the notion of memory when we talk about loving. No question, no question, I agree with you. Uh, I, I would say, I mean, textually, however, um, Again, it, it, memory is not integrated in. This is about living in the present moment, right? And creating a better future. I will tell you that you should come back next year, all of us, because our theme next year will be uh, memory and meaning, the stories we tell about ourselves and others tell as well. And our fall scholar in residence is Dara Horn, the last weekend in October. Dara Horn is the most prolific author and her most recent book, People Love Dead Jews, will be very provocative. Um, so uh, Ellen, you've hit on something. I'm gonna call in Philip and Ellis quickly. Yeah, uh, good morning, Rabbi. Hey, Philip. Um, so I have a, a lot of thoughts about this section. Um, <clears throat> so I like the idea of avoiding idolatrous love of self, by extending, a love, extending love to your neighbor so you don't lose the image of God. I like that, but I, but I think the image of God itself can be dangerous. Um, like the idea of enemies who are intent to destroy you, um, that hating those are, are valid. That sort of justification can be made to do violence on others, terrible violence. And we have mm -hmm. plenty of examples in Torah of that. Um, but then on the other hand, if we're talking about the evil other, right? If we look at L.A. Wiesel, Victor Frankl, they didn't live within hatred. They didn't develop that hatred habit, take over who they were and live within that. 
you know, they ended up living within kind of a loving expression of who they were they were and of Judaism and yeah. sharing that yeah. with others, no, right? Yeah, yeah. no, so, I think that's a key point, though. A key so, point. So then just a little bit more, I was thinking about Bishop's idea of the relationship with God leading to self-examination. Yeah. And, and I wonder about that. I think that for that to happen, you have to have guidance. You have to have a community of shared values. And Musar comes to mind for me, of course, because I've been involved with, with that. Um, so that's that's what I have to say on it. Yeah, no, no, well, well said, and I love. We're going to come back to Wiesel directly in a little bit. So thank you for noting that. And can you live within that loving community in that loving sense of of self? Uh, Ellis, and then I got to go to the text. Uh, just to add another layer of complexion, com complexity to this is that in order for us to love ourselves, to have a comfortability in our skin, that love is not something that we are born with, but it is transferred to us from the environment in which we reside. And if that love fails to be transferred, it will fail to be received. Yeah. And yeah. that is its yeah. own, those are the ingredients of everything else that follows. Yeah. And here's the irony, just to go back to what Philip said, Ellis, because uh, I know the stories, uh, in the midst of a night, the ultimate night in, uh, you know, for in the camps in Bergen Belsen, Rita Grinbaum, our dear member, would talk about how great it was to be cared for by the loving matriarchs in her, in her, you know, in the barracks uh, in Bergen Belsen, and how uh, there was such love between these Jewish women and Jewish children that even the Nazis couldn't destroy the love. Which to me, I can't even imagine, right? But uh, but but she lived it. So I think you're right. We just never know what environment's going to transfer that love. We just never know what it's going to. So we're going to, we're going to do this. Oh, Zebi, Zebi, uh, this is a good lead in. Will yeah, you, will you read, read the uh, before Reb Isra Zalman? Yeah, okay. Uh, before Reb Isra Zalman would deliver his weekly shiur lesson I have a clean in the yeshiva, place. somebody's talking, guys, in the yeshiva, he would go into a small room next to the study hall for 15 minutes to prepare all alone once, once the curious student hoping to hear the rabbi's halakhic preparation opened the door crack to listen and look. <clears throat> to his great surprise, he saw Rav walking back and forth and just repeating to himself over and over again, love your fellow as yourself. Right. So what, why, the, why was this the Rebbe Salafi preparations? Because he was about to teach his students and he knew it would not be easy. That Schmendrick student that's going to ask the stupid question, yada, 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 right? All of us who are teachers and many of us who are parents, no. So go down now to the second commentary on the drash, Rabbi Andrew Sugarman. And you'll get, I think, the core here. Right? Um, yeah, who do I have? I, I, I have, uh, oh, Andy, Andy Rosenthal, I have you next to my list. Do you want to read one? Sure. Excellent. Sure. Um, do you want me to read the Genesis or just? Yeah, the, yeah this is Genesis Rabbi. It's, it's exactly what I based everything on. This is a discussion in uh, the Midrash on what is Klal Gadol Batorah, the greatest principle in Torah. Go ahead. Uh, ben, as I said, this is the record of Adam's line. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. This is a great principle of the Torah, R Rabbi Akiva said. You shall love your fellow as yourself. I am the Lord. This is an even greater principle. So Akiva says the greatest principle in Torah, and there are six different opinions, by the way, is you shall love your fellow or as yourself. I am Adonai. Go ahead, man. At numerous points in Jewish history, rabbis and scholars have addressed the question of what tenet or observance represents the heart of Judaism. Seldom, however, have our teachers argued the converse about a biblical text that ought to be eliminated from the canon. One such instance highlights the significance of the Midrash above and the Torah verses it interprets. In Jane Isay's collection, You Are My Witness, the living words of Rabbi Marshall T. Meyer, an excerpted interview with Rabbi Meyer includes an anecdote about his beloved teacher, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. 
Meyer recounts Professor Heschel provocatively asking a group of his students at JTS if they wished they could remove any commandments from the Torah. Following a pause, Heschel then shared that he himself would uproot Leviticus 19.18, you shall love your fellow as yourself. After a few moments of his students' stunned silence, Heschel explained that this commandment is simply impossible to fulfill, and it's so important. It's the basis of all civilization. This statement presents the paradox of a commandment that undergirds our entire system of ethics, yet whose performance in essence eludes completion. Right, right. As, as Ellis you know, reminded us, a paradox within a paradox, right? Is it even possible to fulfill this? You know, so, you know uh, attested to by many people's frustration at even trying to wrap their heads around it. Andy, go ahead. Heschel's conundrum helps us to understand what is at stake in the dispute between Benazai and Rabbi Akiva over which verse is most fundamental to understanding the Torah. Benazai focuses on the passage that establishes the creation of humanity in God's image and the equality of humankind as descendants of that shared lineage. Rabbi Akiva chooses the biblical version of the golden rule treat others as you would have them treat you, and then explains his selection with the logic of the silver rule, do not do to others what you would not want them to do to you. Rabbi Akiva implicitly incorporates Ben Azai's position within his own in the conclusion to Leviticus 19.18, I am Adonai. Since this phrase names God as both creator of humanity and as our teacher of Torah, Upholding that commandment expresses one's love of God, Torah, and humanity all at once. Right, I would say we don't need the last paragraph, which is about Rabbi Marshall Meyer, um, who, uh, you know, who, who stood up for all people in Buenos Aires in creating um, uh, the major reform congregation there, even a rabbinic seminary, and then coming back and really being the primary founding rabbi of B'nai Jesha, um, of BJ. Uh, but what is Heschel, why, why is Heschel, uh, you know, why if you could do away with one commandment, would it be this one? Because it's really impossible to fully fulfill. Because it's very difficult. All right. You know, um, I would agree completely with Heschel for this reason. Human nature being what it is, it's one thing while well, we're sitting here in Rashomon, safe and sound. But when you are in a situation like we described with Rita, or what's going on in the world now, it's almost impossible to get that kind of feeling out of your head that I could be friends, I could love this person who is my enemy and wants yeah. to destroy everything I value. Yeah. So I think you want to get real. I would agree with him. Yeah. So so I, I so I so would we agree with him? And by the way, he doesn't say he would. He right because. Heschel, I believe, fulfilled the commandment. He, he stood up not just to hatred outside, but to being the least liked professor at JTS. Why? Because he was a bridge builder. Because he was a mystic and not a rationalist. Others did not appreciate Heschel. Others within the system, within the JTS system of the conservative movement. So he had to stand up to dislike among his colleagues. And he was the guy who marched against Vietnam. He was the guy who was the first one. He got arrested with Martin Luther King before any other rabbis did. So Heschel walked the walk and loved his fellow as himself. What is, it, what is um, Andrew Sugarman referring to here? Right? And right, Jesus, Jesus, by the way, was a very good Jewish teacher. Jesus quoted Hillel. What did Hillel say 60 years before Jesus? What is hateful to you, do not do to any person. That's the whole Torah. The rest is commentary. Now go and learn. It's not easy, but it's the whole Torah. So now I want to respond to all the people, Philip among them, right? Um, who, you know, who said, well, how can we, and isn't it possible to exist in that place of love, even in the midst of hell? 
I would say it is. And I would say that we can um, maintain love your fellow as yourself at the same time as we stand up to evil when it confronts us. I don't think it's either or, I think it's both and. And to me, I read this Brett Stevens piece. I don't always agree with everything Brett Stevens says. Uh, no, it's not that one, it's the end, it's the show. I'm going to the show, Raj. Um, the Brett Stevens piece is great. Um, uh, I, I have Karen Ryder and Shana, if they wanna split this, if it's okay. Right, uh, uh, Karen, why don't you start? Um, it's about Volodymyr Zelensky, uh, a, uh, a Ukrainian leader with amazing courage, and I would say a model of this very difficult command. Love your neighbor as yourself. You tell me why. Why do we uh, admire Volodymyr Zelensky? The question almost answers itself. We admire him because in the face of unequal odds, Ukraine's president stands his ground because he shows that honor of others and love of country are virtues we forsake at our peril. Because he grasps the power of personal example and physical presence. Because he knows how words can inspire deeds. We admire Zelensky because of who and what he faces. Putin represents neither a nation nor a cause, only a totalitarian ethos. The Russian dictator stands for the idea that truth exists to serve power, not the other way around. And that politics is in the business of manufacturing propaganda for those who will swallow it, imposing terror on those who will not. Ultimately, the aim of this idea isn't the mere acquisition of power or territory, it's the eradication of conscience. We admire Zelensky because he has restored the idea of the free world to its proper place. The free world is not a cultural expression nor an economic description. Membership in the free world belongs to any country that subscribes to the notion that the power of the state exists first and foremost to protect the rights of the individual. And the responsibility of the free world is to aid and champion any of its members menaced by tyranny. As it goes for Ukraine, so eventually will it go for the rest of us. <laughs> One more pair. We admire Zelensky because he embodies two great Jewish archetypes, David in the face of Goliath and Moses in the face of Pharaoh. He is the uncanny underdog who with skill and wits makes up for what he lacks in fearsomeness and brawn. He is the prophet who revolts against the diminishment and entrapment of his people, determined to lead them through trials towards self-determination, freedom and ethics. All right, Shana, pick it up and we'll, then we'll all talk. We admire Zelensky because he rouses the better angels of our nature. His leadership has made Joe Biden a better president, Germany a better country, NATO a better alliance. He has shaken much of the United States out of its isolationist stupor into which it was gradually falling. We admire Zelensky because he maintains a sense of human proportion befitting a democratically elected leader. Note the contrast between his public encounters with journalists, cabinet members, foreign leaders, and ordinary citizens, and the Stalinist, and the Stalinist antics of the Putin court. In the ostentatious trappings of Russian power, we see the smallness of the man wielding it, the paranoia and insecurity of a despot who knows he may someday have to sell his kingdom for a horse. We admire Zelensky because he models what a man, a man should be, impressive without being imposing, confident without being cocksure, intelligent without pretending to be infallible, sincere rather than cynical, courageous, not because he is fearless, but because he advances with a clear conscience. American boys in particular, raised in preposterous notions of what manhood entails, should be steered toward his example. We admire Zelensky because he holds out hope that our own troubled democracies may yet elect leaders who can inspire, ennoble, even save us. Perhaps we can do so when the hour isn't quite as late as it is now for the people of Ukraine and their indomitable leader. Mm. All right, let's get rid of this and let's all talk. So is and how is do I see, I think, um, uh, Zelensky being actually a model of what the intent of the Hafta Loreacha Kamocha is? Well, he's... <laughs> He's definitely gone deep within himself and deeper and deeper every time you see him, you know, express himself. 
Okay. He's stronger. He's not weaker. And All right. He's gained. Oh, yeah. 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 So he's gained strength in the midst of the struggle. How else is he a model or does he speak to, or does our admiration speak to of him? If we, if, you know, I think we, there are lots of things to admire, but how, how, how does he fulfill love your neighbor as yourself? I am not or not. Or love your fellow as yourself. I am not or not. He's speaking for everybody else. He's speaking for everybody else, meaning Harold talks. Yeah. The way I see it, uh, the way I see him. Hold on, Raj, hold on a sec, Raj, hold on a sec. Well, you got Harold talking. Go ahead. He's advocating for everybody else in his society and advocating that everybody should be a better person. He's advocating for everybody else in his society and that everybody should be a better person, should rise, right? Right, he's trying to bring out the better angels of our nature by being his best self. Right, Raj. Uh, we see him every day on the on the uh, like on TV uh, as an ordinary person uh, with the people, uh, doing his like you know regular speeches, uh, connected with the people. He is with them, uh, with the regular soldiers. He's not like Putin or anyone else. Right, not even like a general. It is not fall, he has never fallen prey to the pedestal complex, right? Lifting him above. He is below. The fact that he wears the green t-shirt and you know the, the fatigues of the military, I mean he's making a statement because he could wear something else. Right. But he's saying something. He's saying, listen, I'm not getting dressed up for a war. I'll tell you right now. It's hell for all of us. I don't know if Ellen or Jane still have their hand up before I call in Philip, because you have hands up. I don't know if it's from before or you just wanted to applaud me. Whatever you, I don't know. <laughs> anyway. I'm thinking. Oh, I'm oh thinking, Jane, go ahead. I'm thinking that, that um, he's very much what we used to call a man of the people. He not only speaks for people, but he represents them in his attitude, in his speech, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. the way he behaves. As Harold just said, agreed. No question. I got Philip. I got Elizabeth. Yeah, um, just a small thing. I, I don't turn on the television very much, so I don't. I haven't heard much of what Zelensky has said, but the reports about it, I've never heard of him demonizing Russia or even Putin. I've heard him talk about let's um, let's meet, let's talk, something like that. So he doesn't demonize, even when it's the enemy who he has a right right to fight. He is humane in the face of horror and hate. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, Elizabeth. That's exactly what I was about to say, that he refuses to demonize the Russians. You know, he acknowledges their humanity. Um, I don't know any, how many of us could do that. No, uh, very few. And what was his training? He was a TV actor. Right? A comedian. <laughs> he was a comedian, a TV actor, and his sitcom, right, which was really very, very well received uh, in 2011, was that he was a high school teacher, was frustrated with the state, so he decided to run for president, and he won. And then seven years later, he won, for real. And I think in in his humanity and in his acknowledgement of even the humanity of those committing atrocities against his people. He is preserving something so important, which is he refuses to be, to be demonized by those who could be forgotten that they're human too. He is not letting hate define him. Beautiful, yeah, yeah, I got Wayne and I got Arnie. Uh, I, I would say to some degree, he reminds me uh, of Mandela to some degree, having been in prison for 27 years, when he came out, he, he would not allow himself to become what he was fighting against. And I think that's what Zelensky conveys to me is that he's not gonna become a Putin. Yeah, 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 beautiful, yeah, yeah. So uh, in my mind, he represents what we would all hope to become should we be confronted with that. But as I think about it, why can't we become that without the harsh reality of what's in his face? 
That is what Toe is trying to do. Toe is trying to make us into menches, into <laughs> courageous, compassionate human beings who lead with love every day by how we treat the smallest among us, the most insignificant among us, the most disturbing among us, right? That's what Torah's trying to do. That's what they're trying to do. And, and, and the teaching is powerful, if not profound, because to the degree to which we can fulfill this impossible commandment, we make God real. Ani Adonai. Why does it say Ani Adonai after everyone and especially after this one? Because it's saying to us, if I am the God of becoming, you are a human being of becoming. becoming. And the more you become holy, the more humane you are, the more you don't, you know, rob and cheat, the more you don't take advantage of people who are disadvantaged, the more I am present in the world. Mm -hmm. So there's something profound about this. Ellen Wiesel, I'm going to bring it back to Wiesel and end with this. Ellen Wiesel, our teacher, said, the opposite of love is not hate. It's indifference. Mm. The opposite of, of art is not ugliness. It's indifference. I could go on. There are seven sentences, he said, and then he wrote them. I heard him say it in class in 19... Uh, 80, not 80, was it 80? No, I, I was, I was in school, 1978. Um, uh, and what Professor Wiesel was trying to tell us is this. Love is in our hands. If we was, respond to hate with hate, we are diminishing God's presence in the world. If we can figure out how to respond to, right, all those nasty folks and people and right, if we can figure out how to respond to be strong enough to respond to with love which is why i think Zelensky is the model what is Zelensky doing he's saying i love all these people ukraine is part of you you are part of ukraine we're all connected in this and what this guy over there putin's doing is wrong he's caught right so he is fulfilling verse 17 Verse 17 says, stand up and repro reprove your kin. Call out a neighbor or another person when they're doing wrong. But that doesn't mean that you should follow their lead in hate. Right? Lead with love. I think that's what he's doing. That doesn't mean you don't defend yourself. That doesn't mean you're not courageous and compassionate. It does mean, as Wayne said, right, and Susan said, and so many others said, that you remain true to yourself and try to be a mensch. Hillel said it, where no one is acting like a human being, strive all the more to be a mensch. Be a mensch. That's what Zelensky's doing. So all of you are in the mensch club as of today. Rabbi, Rabbi, yes. here was... Rabbi was, uh, Shakespeare was quoting Torah when he said, to thine own self be true. And as the night follows the day, you can not be false to any man. I think that's true, right? I think that's true. Of course, you have to know yourself in order to be true to yourself. That's the challenge. Folks, next week, we're going to be in a really wonderful, difficult moment in Torah and Amor, We we're going to kill the blasphemer. I can't wait. <laughs> Jeffrey, that was beautiful. Have a happy Mother's Day, ladies. Or happy, Mother's Mother's Day. Day. Happy, happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Hi, Susan. Happy Mother's Day. Hi, Wayne. That was Hi. wonderful, Wayne. I love, love what you, you. Have to say. Thank you. Love Bye, you. everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You guys. Thank you, Elizabeth. God bless.